to the Burnout Podcast, where we discuss all things agile software development and delivery. We will be giving you an honest take on tools and techniques. We'll share our experiences, debunk myth, and hopefully provide needed inspiration. Hi, I'm Todd Anderson, Consultant Delivery Manager. I've done just about every job in IT from tech support, programmer, network security, project and program management. I can't say I've done everything, but I've seen a lot. And I'm Marcel Bridge, digital consultant, business analyst and product owner. I've worked in digital before this even had a name and since have been quite a bit around the blog. And this is my way of giving back to the industry. So sit back, relax and settle in for this week's episode. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Burn Up. This week we'll have a number of super interesting guests and we'll be discussing remote interviewing with them. Remote interviewing is a, a thing that's really close to my heart because A, I have always remote interviewed quite a bit, but more recently with the coronavirus, of course, remote working and remote interviewing as, as part of remote working practices has just become um, much, much more important for organizations. The first person you'll hear from is Becky Smith, a recruiter and people manager we've worked with for years and has been recently working in Berlin. We'll introduce the other guests as we go. Oh gosh, I've got a really funny job title. It's VP of Product Engagement. Ooh. Yeah, what does that even mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, the reason for it was because um, slightly different in Germany, and I think that people didn't really understand what the word or the term people manager really meant. Um, but also a German, uh, Germany is slightly more hierarchical. And when I was having to talk to or reach out to interim CTOs and mm. people of a certain seniority, I think that um, they were looking at my profile and immediately thinking maybe I was a bit more junior than perhaps I was. Ah. So we did a bit of research and that seemed to make sense. And I have to say, I have, I've uh, seen an increase in people coming back to me. So I think it's done the trick. You, so, you have to play that game with, with you know, matching the relevant cultures, hierarchy yeah. of titles, I think. So what's your role? Okay, so, I mean, it's very people-based. The most important part of my role is getting people into the Equal Experts Network and through an interview process. We don't hire people for specific clients, um, but we find good people, we put them through a process, and then there's the second part of the role, which is finding them the right type of client, the right type of work. Uh, so you get, obviously, heavily involved in the interviewing process, and I mean, we, we can say the interviewing process at Equal Experts is a three-stage process where you do a screening call, which yeah. is just an initial chat, usually on the phone. And then there was a second stage, a face-to-face -face interview, which we call the skills-based interview, which is depending on the discipline, case study based with two peers that interview the candidate. And then there was a final interview, which I think we these days call the consulting skills interview, which is more about chemistry and do you have the right consulting soft skills to fit into Equal Experts. Now, this was all very much face-to-face -face, uh, in the yeah. past. And more recently, and I think part of the, the situation we're in right now with, with the coronavirus, but also I think generally um, because we're a more distributed organization, this changed to becoming more remote interview style. And I just wanted to hear from your perspective. Do you think this is a good idea? Do you think we're just doing this because we have to out of necessity or is it something that actually, you know, that has benefits? And When I worked in the London team, everything was face to face because it could be. But then when I moved to the German business unit, we were essentially growing from, from almost nothing. And the same process applied for anyone in Germany that wanted to come into the German network or the Equal Experts Network. So actually, I've been um, helping facilitate remote interviews now for about a year because we've just had to because I didn't have interviewers based in Germany. So I think this is something that um, was changing anyway, and I think the, the current emergency will, will only change people's behaviours sufficiently. So becomes much more normal uh, going forward. So, so you're suggesting it's, it, it was kind of on the horizon anyway, and now we're just maybe accelerating that shift a little bit. There's been a marked change in the quality of some of the tooling, and I think that's really what's opened it up. So uh, even jumping from, so going from Skype to Zoom, uh, there's, a, there's a material difference in the quality uh. of the service. You know, Zoom, it just deals with dropouts slightly more effectively, 
Um, it's just much, much easier to use. And it's not just Zoom as well. So whiteboarding with Miro. So this was Dave, one of Equal Experts engagement managers, whom you have met in episode eight, where he introduces the role of the engagement manager. Dave has a keen interest in um, remote working. He's been instrumental in pulling together Equal Experts Remote Playbook, which is freely available on their website. Link is always in the show notes. We'll talk more about tools later, but first we wanted to understand whether remote interviewing was a necessity, convenience, or had wider, bigger benefits for organizations or candidates. In a second, you'll hear from Werner Schmidt, who is a delivery lead in South Africa and has worked quite a bit across country borders. We've done a couple of remote interviews in the last two months, actually. All right. Um, just to work around people's schedules. Ah, yeah. uh, a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people when they, when they start job hunting, they try to do their interviews sort of in their lunch hours or before work or straight after work. Uh, I think it is a good thing uh, because uh, as a, I mean, in the previous job, I was a product manager for an applicant tracking system. So one of the biggest challenges that any recruiter faces to get the time from the candidate, from the interviewing team, and, and then align it. And there's a lot of back and forth going on between. I guess what's really helped me is being able to remote interview people has given me access to more people than I would have originally had. You know, you have, I don't know, for example, I've got a candidate that lives in Malta, happy to come to Berlin for a gig, but not happy to come to Berlin for an interview that he might not pass, might not get the role, etc. So that's been really cool. Um, that's really interesting because that means that organizations can just expand their, their talent pool on, you know, uh, globally even potentially. At the moment, of course, we're... The, the people that we're meeting will be onboarded remotely anyway. So they're not going to be meeting the client in body. They won't be meeting us in body. Yes. So does it really matter? I don't think so. So I have to say my experience so far has been quite positive. We were also keen to understand whether remote interviewing works and what candidates think of it. I actually think people are always pleasantly surprised when I've offered it. I think it's just a little bit easier for everybody. I mean, our interview process is great because it gives people the ability to showcase their skills. You know, how do they get information out of people? How do they deal with a difficult stakeholder? How do they visualize yes. stuff? How do they come across in the Zoom call, for example? You know, those are all really useful things to examine. I mean, look, sometimes things go wrong, but they go wrong in face-to-face -face interviews too, of course. Of course but, they do, yeah. Um, I think probably there's more that can go wrong in a remote interview. I don't know, a, a Wi-Fi problems mm. or whatever yeah most of the feedback has been okay i mean you always have to take some of the feedback with um a pinch of salt because of course if the person hasn't done very well um and they haven't passed uh sometimes they can reflect negatively on the experience yes. it's hard to decipher whether it was because it was remote or it's just that they weren't going to pass anyway i mean i only had two which i didn't think were that great so one we had to we had to postpone that basically that person couldn't get their headphones to work yeah. they didn't check before whether their audio setup was working and then you know we okay fine and we tried a fallback, we tried Zoom, then we tried Slack, and then we tried Hangouts. None, none of that worked. And at that point, we're like, sorry. Mm -hmm. But we re-interviewed, and that was fine. What I find is it takes a bit longer to build, I don't want to say relationship, but report with the person remotely. That is a bit easier because, you know, you pick them up at the lift, you get, you get them a coffee, you have a bit of chit-chat, whereas in the remote interview, it's like, right, you know, person joins, <laughs> and you're like, here is your case study. Yeah, I, and actually, I have had some feedback on that where a couple of candidates said, it feels a bit impersonal. It feels feels like you arrive for this interview and the skills uh -huh. and this scenario and that is all you do and then you leave. But I have had that feedback in face to face, but I've had that more from people that have interviewed remotely. So yes, it's interesting. It's quite difficult, especially if you're not used to building a rapport very quickly on a Zoom call. Like, because I'm doing it, you know, three yeah. times a day, every yes. day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I'm just, I don't know, I'm so used to it. I mean, to be honest, I think you only find out once they have actually done a project. Yes. Oh, yes. Ultimately, it's what they do in their first two weeks. Of course, the most important thing was, what advice would we give a candidate going to a remote interview? I mean, it seems a bit basic, but of course, a really good internet connection. I know it sounds silly, but sometimes people don't check that. And if you have a bad internet connection, it isn't going to work. And actually, that can work against you because why haven't you organized that before the interview? Candidates should ensure that the obvious technical things work. So make sure that your computer works. Make sure your camera works. It's good quality. Make sure the sound works. Test the link beforehand. 
You should also ensure your background is appropriate. Make sure you're in a quiet space, free of distractions. Make sure you're well-dressed, at least from the waist up. When I interview people, what I'm mainly doing is trying to picture that person in the role I'm asking them to be in. So uh, that's sort of two aspects. One, can they actually do the role? Do they have the experience and the ability? On the other side is, do they have the cultural fit? Do they have the right mentality? These are just kind of general interview guidelines. But if you sort of think, put yourself in the interviewer's shoes, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to they're trying to see whether you, you can fit into that role. Give them reasons to picture you in that, that position. Tagging an experience to your response I think is really important to actually show that you can do the role with real examples and, and also be be clear about your shortcomings. Um, I think that's always good. Honesty is the best policy. I don't really care where you do it as long as it's not noisy. Yes. Um, because that's going to make you more uncomfortable than it is me. If I can't share you, I'm simply going to say it was a crap interview. I don't think this person is worth it. Let's move on. And that's to be honest, I mean, because I can't hear anything. So nothing that you say is making any impact on me. I can't make good decisions. I'm going to say the interview was a fail. We either need to reschedule it or let's just move on because this isn't work. For a candidate, choose a space that is quiet. Choose a space that is well lit. Yeah. Choose a space that it is easy for you to reach things like a piece of paper or a pen or, yes. you know, God forbid you need it, a uh, vacuum cleaner. Um, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so that's an important thing. Um, and then also a big thing with, with remote interviews is people also need to take the freedoms to be more relaxed. So I would almost, I would almost want to say it's sometimes better to remote interview from home because it's an environment that you trust and you're used to. What makes remote interview successful are, first of all, making it very clear to the candidate that it's going to be a remote interview and getting to them to consciously think about what it means for them. So I think sometimes people don't necessarily think about the extra preparation that they might need uh-huh. to do yep. or the fact they need to be in an appropriate space, you know, yes. and make sure they don't have a bright light behind them so we can't see the candidate. Don't do from uh, noisy places. Uh, if you can have a good uh, set of uh, yes. a good Head- headset, it's really yep. important, especially with uh, microphone noise cancelling like the one you have and I have. Mm-hmm. It's not that expensive. Or try to make sure that you won't be interrupted yes. while doing yeah. the interview so that you can be focused. This was Nuno Silva Pereira, who works as a delivery lead out of Lisbon and has a keen interest in agile working practices. Nuno also runs a couple of meetups and conferences in Portugal and has recently released a album with his metal band, which I highly recommend you check out. Nuno has also released an amazing YouTube video on remote working best practices. Link in the show notes. Nuno and I have remote interviewed quite a bit, so I was very keen to hear his thoughts on the topic. The other thing that we always say is to make sure that they've got access to some type of visual board. Whatever yeah. that, whatever they want to use is absolutely fine and make sure that they're able to share their screen. I mean, that's crucial. It depends on what they have available to them, right? So, for example, I've got a whiteboard in my office. Yeah. It ain't that difficult for me to pick up my laptop, walk to the whiteboard, sort of nice. hold it. You just shout at me and tell me, you know, I can't see or I can't see. If the candidate's working on paper, I would very oftentimes ask them to do this. Yeah. Point the camera uh, to the paper sort of somewhere here and just start talking me through, you know, what you've been doing or whatever it is. Yep. Um, that's pretty much the easiest way to visualize. When it comes to things like uh, technical interviews, there you use screen share. That's normally the easiest way. Yeah. I personally don't like asking a candidate to please draw out your delivery plan in Google Sheets for me. Because not everyone is at my level of, I can draw anything out in Google Sheets in a couple of minutes. I've spent years in yeah, it. Yeah. It's easy for me. A lot of people prefer pen and paper because that is just, it's simpler. Yeah. So don't complicate their lives by asking them to use a tool that they might not be that familiar with or that, that actually slows them down. Important one because the way we do interviews is right that it's not just a chat. We may, we have this case study and we we like if people visualize things, whatever that means. Yeah. And yeah, whether they share a scribble with us on camera or they, I mean, I personally prefer if they use any kind of tool like Google Draw, Miro, or one of those. Um, that makes a big difference, I think, uh, because that's mm-hmm. the same stuff we're using with our clients. I mean, I'm not sure whether you've heard we're doing a lot of possibly going forward a lot of remote inceptions or project kickoffs. So we'll have to do the same thing with our clients. Real 
real-time collaboration boards. So to demonstrate that you can handle these things in an interview, that's of course a, yeah, we want to work with that person rather than another person who's like, no, I'm not that comfortable. Uh, one would be, be mindful of the time that you're speaking. Again, in a face-to-face -face interview, probably a little bit of fidgeting from the interviewer and, and stuff like that helps you to understand that, you know, you're not going on and on and on and on. But unfortunately, in a remote interview where I have been in a couple of cases, where as an interviewer, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to not to cut you off, not, not to try to be rude, but I'm not seeing you logically stopping somewhere. It's been like 10 minutes of monologue from you and I'm like, stop it. I have more questions. I want to explore something, right? <laughs> yeah. so, so I think it is good to keep an eye on the, on the elapsed time for your responses and keep validating, you know, do they need more explanation or, or is it good enough for them to ask the next thing that they want to explore? So I think you have to be cognizant of the time. I think it's a really important point you just made and maybe coming back to what you said earlier about having the video on, right? So I'm looking at you, you're nodding and I'm like, yeah, okay, okay. And then there is a point maybe when, because if the video is off, you're talking into a black corridor, right? Yep. Yep. And then because there's silence, most likely you are on mute because you don't want to have noise come into the conversation. I have no fucking clue whether you're even there. <laughs> and exactly. you, want, you want to fill the silence, right? So you keep on talking, 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 yeah. but you don't want to interrupt me. And so it is a good point maybe to really have shorter pieces and then be more like, have I answered the question or do you want me to elaborate? Yep. And then you can yep. say, yes, go on. Or no, you know what? I'm fine with this. Let's go to the next thing. This was Rajesh Tiagarajan, who works out of Bangalore and is a product consultant and business analyst. Not only has he experience in remote interviewing, but Rajesh and I were recently co-hosting a four-day remote training session across Bangalore, London and Pune. Finally, we wanted to understand what remote interviewers needed to consider when running remote interviews. There's a lot more effort that goes into planning the actual interview every time. I would probably have an hour conversation just with the person that I'm bringing along to the interview with me so that we can, we can yeah, understand, yeah. you know, these are the questions, this is what we're looking for, this is how we're going to handle the candidate, time boxing, et cetera, et cetera. So there's that level of prep that goes into uh -huh. even before yes. you do the remote interview. I think we may have to prepare from, a, from how, what kind of tools we need to evolve or how to adapt to ensure that the interviewer feels much comfortable doing yeah. certain activities that we want them to. Next, we'll hear from Neha Dutt, who is a product consultant based in London. Neha and I have co-written the infamous Inception Playbook, collaborated on a number of conference talks and projects. Neha is co-author of Equal Experts Remote Working Playbook and runs a training session on remote team practices. In order to make a remote interview successful, we need to sometimes redesign the interview process. So it's it's, it's more appropriate for being remote. So for example, yeah. everybody joins remotely, you know, um, there'll be times when you want to give the candidate time to think. So in the real world, we might step away, go out of the room and sit somewhere uh, else. Yeah. We have to think of a graceful way of doing that and letting the candidate also let us know if they need help from us. So just almost like prototyping and playing through what the remote experience yes. is going to be like and having an answer for like each of the different circumstances we come across, I think becomes very important for a remote interview to be successful. If you pick the wrong tools, it just makes, it just adds friction. There is something to be said for maintaining a certain level of professionalism when you're doing an interview. So having a child run in shouting, come and look at the ghost. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think it gives a very human, it, it adds a very human element to it, but it's in an interview situation, not necessarily conducive to the candidate. The candidate is in any case already on their nerves. Yes. They, they, they're, they're already enjoying a stressful environment. And now you have this guy that very, very quickly turns away from the camera and talks to his child about, I'm not going to turn to a ghost, and then comes back. And you sort of go, well, how important is this really if you can just stop in the middle? But it's a remote working mentality. And especially when you remote work from home in a situation like this, it just becomes part of your life. And people yes. need to be cognizant of the fact that you have to maintain a certain level of professionalism when you're doing a remote interview. I think it's important to have a bit at the beginning, even though sometimes it can be a bit stilted, but where you kind of get to know each other like you would in a lift. I like to even out the, uh, the playing yeah. field. I can make anyone feel at ease that's on the, on the same playing field as me, but this is an interview and that person is in a very high anxiety space already. Yes. yes. So being aware of that is extremely important and adjusting your strategy accordingly. Nothing beats a handshake. 
there is that element of uh, human interaction that goes missing with a remote interview that you can't necessarily control anymore. I do think it's important to have a face-to-face -face meeting at some point. I think it's good for the candidate. I think it's good for, for us as an organization. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it's a deal breaker. You know, if I had one tip that I would say, which is turn your video on. I probably still do the same sorts of things, but it's maybe just a little bit harder to read the body language. I don't think it's a huge impediment, though. It's important that whenever we're doing um, a remote uh, video call, like we're yes. doing, that we can see everybody's face. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. In case of an interview, that's easy because even not only looking at the interview, but if we're pairing me and you on this interview, yeah. I might see your face and ask you something, especially when we're role playing. Yes. Um, yeah. That's part of the chemistry. So yeah. I think that we should uh, be focused on seeing everybody's face so that yeah. it's not only voice. We should follow the rule of one remote, all remote. That will make us be all on the same um, page. We've got to this point where we've decided that where there are multiple people involved in the interview, as you mentioned, you know, the two doing the actual interview and then the candidate, that it was best to have everybody remote. It became quite difficult when there were two people in a room and someone else was remote yes. for many reasons. But I think the biggest problem was sometimes the conversation was going on with the candidate and one of the interviewers and then the remote interviewer couldn't really hear what was going on. You know, if I'm part of a panel, uh, I would prefer everybody to be remote rather than be sitting in a room and just only the, the interviewee being on the on the other side remote, right? That, Why that, is that? I think, uh, I, I think it creates a power imbalance, especially, you know, when the person is not physically in front of you, there can be a lot of nonverbal communication and signaling going on between the interviewers and, and the interviewee has no clue about it. Also, you can confer with the other interviewer if you're all remote separately to what's actually going on in the room, which I think is quite nice. You can have... A everyone is on, a, on, on their computer, you can have a Slack channel open in the background and have mm. a back channel, which actually gives you even more control over the interview than you had to have in real life because you can yeah. be like, are we, are we sticking too long? Are we laboring the point or should we move on? Executing remote interviews with back channels, it's extremely important because in an interview, sometimes it's important to say, I need you to ask this question. The quality of your microphone. So when you, if you have a boom mic over and not a boom mic, it just makes people experience mm. uh, it, it much better. It is good to abort an interview if there are challenges rather than somehow flow it through. For example, I would prefer video to be on on both the ends. And let us say, give like 10 minutes to see everything settles down and we are in another room. But in 10 minutes, we figure out that I can't hear you, you can't hear me, it's choppy, breaking. Rather than somehow flow it through, it is better to reschedule it than you know, going it. So that's kind of it. We hope that was interesting. Before we hear final words from our guests, please do check out the show notes if you're interested in any of the materials we mentioned. And if it's just Nuno's metal album, that's totally cool. Famous last words or anything? Or <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I honestly think it's the way forward. I think it's great. We'll be doing more of it. We're getting more and more successful. I think we're actually testing more skills than we do face to face in a way when this whole coronavirus thing is, is um well over it's probably not the right word but anyway i think it probably depends on the context so if, if for example a person is going to be hired and they are going to have to work in a remote fashion with their team or with the client it's yes. really important that actually we can assess how they are in that forum you know and i think given where things are going and certainly at least for the next say six months I would argue that it, it totally makes sense to do remote interviews, not only from a health and safety perspective, but because we need to make sure people are able to communicate in that yes, remote world. Exactly. And, and it, it is very different communicating over, over Slack or mm -hmm. over sort of video as it is communicating face to face. You have to be far clearer with your communication. You need to be a lot more tolerant. You, <laughs> yeah. need, to, um, you, know, you need to think a lot more upfront and just be very specific about very particular things and close feedback loops and ask people, did they understand what you were saying? Because you don't have a lot of those social cues uh, that yep. if you were in the office. So actually, I think it's a good opportunity to be able to test these things or assess these things in both directions for the candidate as well as the interviewer i think it's an inevitability now I, I don't think there is a good or bad i think it's just something that's just standard practice that you're going to have to remote interview people so you should just be prepared to do it and, and do it well given the current situation with covid virus you know obviously there's a necessity around remote interviewing maybe the knock-on effect of this is to prove that remote working is a thing that people can do and be effective and be productive at
But I think the future of interviewing is going to have to be this way. We have to start looking at the concept of it's a global community. Of, so if you find the right person to do the job and they're in Zaire, you could go through the whole process of trying to get them into the country. Find the right person for the job wherever they are. You can figure out the logistics later. The fact is that there are brilliant skills trapped in countries that can't get out. I've yep. met some of these people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I spent some time in Nigeria now. There are brilliant skills that are simply locked inside the country that can't get out. And I, and I hope that whenever this uh, COVID-19 coronavirus thing calms down, which I hope, it does for the sake of humankind, uh, that we understand a bit more uh, and, and have more respect for remote working. It's actually uh, really, that's a silver lining here, I see, because I feel like I have, and maybe you as well, I have certainly done travel where now I'm thinking, would I do that again in the future? Maybe not. Um, you know, especially the, 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 the travel where you're like going up on a train two hours to Manchester for an interview or a meeting, or you fly over to Berlin quickly. It's maybe not always needed, and maybe we can do more, more, more remotely. I think we can. Becky, if people are interested in working with equal experts... Anyone who's interested, definitely reach out. We're interested in talking to everybody. There's a hello at equalexperts.com. Or feel free to reach out to anyone that they might know at, um, on LinkedIn that's already working for equal yeah. experts. And we're looking for the full breadth of anyone really involved in software delivery from uh, account services, engagement management, project management delivery to yeah, product people, business analysts, to software engineers, designers, the full thing, right? Yeah. So, I mean, anyone who's, in, who's part of a cross-functional team, we're interested in speaking to, cross-functional delivery team. And yeah, engagement managers, interim CTOs. I mean, anywhere, anyone that works in software. Yeah. and understands or knows what Agile is, get in touch. Yes. <laughs> That's it for today's episode. Have a look at our show notes with related information and details on how to get in touch at thebarnup.com. We are listener-driven, so please do send us your questions, comments, and ideas for new episodes. We're both practitioners and are happy to discuss interesting opportunities from consulting to coaching to getting involved in actual projects. For inquiries, please visit burnupmedia.com. This podcast is produced by Burnup Media Limited under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 license, which means you can share it as long as you give credit cannot change it or make money of it. Until next time, thanks again for listening and have a wonderful day.